Hi everyone, my name is Jack Neal and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, disturbing, and morbid. In today's video, we will be talking about three people who came face to face with infamous serial killers and lived to tell the tale. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button, or else. Let's get into the video. And don't forget, look behind you. Ted Bundy, a serial killer regarded for his charisma and charm and his impeccable ability to use these traits to gain the trust of his victims. Between 1974 and 1978, Bundy raped, murdered, and kidnapped 30 girls across seven states. The true number of victims is actually unknown, but published estimates assume it to be a hundred or more. But today we're talking about one girl who wasn't added to Bundy's long list of victims. On the morning of January 8th, 1978, Ted Bundy checks into a Holiday Inn near a Florida State University under the alias Chris Hagen. This is his second escape from jail, and within the past few weeks he's stolen cars, hitchhiked on motorcycles, train hopped, and done just about anything to make it to Florida. His goal is to get off the grid, get a real job, and do anything to not attract the attention of the law. But just a week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Bundy sneaks into FSU's Chi Omega sorority house through a back entrance. In a span of about 15 minutes, he goes on a murderous rampage, attacking several young women. At around 2.45 in the morning, he beats 21-year-old Margaret Bowman over the head with a piece of firewood and then strangles her with a nylon stocking. Soon after, he walks into the bedroom of 20-year-old Lisa Levy, strikes her repeatedly until she goes unconscious, bites her multiple times, and then sexually assaults her with a hairspray bottle. He then crosses the hallway and goes into the room of Kathy Kleiner. On his way in, he trips over a trunk near her bed, and she wakes up to see a dark figure hovering above her. Bundy then takes a club, raises it over his head, and slams it on Kathy, breaking her jaw in three places. He swings over and over again, but before he could kill her, the room suddenly becomes illuminated with light. Through Kathy's window are the headlights of a fellow sorority sister getting out of her boyfriend's car after a late date. At this moment she's thinking, I see the light. This is God's light. Bundy immediately rushes out of Kathy's room, sparing her life, but two of her sorority sisters are not so lucky. Ted Bundy is eventually arrested a few weeks later in Jacksonville, but not before murdering his last victim, a 12 year old girl. Kathy actually testifies in court against Bundy, and when she goes up to the stand, he's staring her down. She answers all the court's questions while maintaining a direct glare right at him. The last question. Kathy, did you see this man in your room? Unfortunately, Kathy had sworn in by oath and could only tell the truth, so in this case, she had only seen Bundy's shadow. However, this technical detail didn't save him, for on January 24th, 1989, Ted Bundy was executed by electric chair. Jeffrey Dahmer, the man with a reputation so infamous that his nickname of Milwaukee Cannibal doesn't quite do his twisted legacy justice. From the late 70s to the early 90s, Jeffrey Dahmer went on a murderous rampage specifically targeting young men and boys. He would use their corpses for cannibalism, necrophilia, and would even make them into trophies. It was also reported that Dahmer would drill holes into the heads of his victims and pour in acid to turn them into sex zombies. He was responsible for the death of 17 individuals. And on July 22nd, 1991, Dahmer would have killed his 18th victim had 32-year-old Tracy Edwards not escaped. It's a seemingly ordinary Monday night when Tracy and his friends are out at a bar and Dahmer approaches them and offers $100 and a free beer to do a nude photo shoot at his apartment. Tracy agrees, and when they arrive at Dahmer's apartment, things start to become very suspicious. They have some lighthearted conversation until Dahmer suggests that Tracy take a look at his tropical fish. And as soon as Tracy turns his head, Dahmer puts a handcuff on one of his wrists, but Tracy pulls away before he can lock the other. Dahmer then instructs Tracy to take off his shirt and then proceeds to rest his head on his soon-to-be victim's chest. He listens closely to his heartbeat, and then tells Tracy that he's going to eat his heart out. At this moment, Tracy does not want to set him off. Dahmer has a knife pressed against his bare skin. He has two options. Jump out the nearby window in Dahmer's two-story apartment, 
or wait until the opportunity is right and bolt for the door. He begins to calm Dahmer down, ensuring him over and over again that they're such good friends and that he would never run away. At this point, Dahmer is ecstatic, so much so that he has a lapse of judgment and allows Tracy to grab a beer from the living room. Tracy seizes this opportunity and while standing up for the couch, punches Dahmer straight in the face. Dahmer loses balance, giving Tracy just enough time to bolt out the door and run for his life. He explains that some freak was holding him captive and details how he'd spent the last several hours trying to escape this deranged man's apartment. The officers then take Tracy back to Dahmer's apartment in hopes of retrieving the key to unlock his handcuffs. Inside, they find a relaxed Dahmer who allows the three men into his home while he retrieves the key. But as Dahmer walks off, one of the police officers notices something particular. It appears to be a stack of Polaroids falling out of one of the cupboards. He gets a closer look and it appears that these photos are of human bodies in various stages of mutilation. And when Dahmer comes back, he immediately notices the officer's looks of disgust and tries to fight them to escape arrest. The police overpower Dahmer, place him in handcuffs, and pin him against the ground. The Milwaukee cannibal then mutters under his breath, For what I have done, I should be dead. The subsequent investigation forces those working on the case to have to snoop through Dahmer's grisly apartment. They uncover various pieces of evidence, and the chief medical examiner says it's more like dismantling someone's museum than an actual crime scene. Inside, they find four severed heads in the kitchen, seven bleached skulls in the closet, and two human hearts in the fridge. The killer's freezer also contains a full human torso and a bag of various organs. This abundance of disturbing evidence leads to Jeffrey Dahmer's arrest, and in 1991 he's tried in Milwaukee for 15 counts of first degree murder and received 16 life sentences. But just three years into his sentence in 1994, Dahmer's killed by a fellow inmate, Christopher Scarver. The two were assigned to clean the prison gym, and when Dahmer turned his back, Scarver beat him over the head with a 20 inch metal bar from the weight room. Scarver received two additional life sentences, and when asked why he did it, he said that Dahmer made him extremely uncomfortable and was not sorry for what he did. On July 5th, 1985, a 16-year-old girl by the name of Whitney Bennett wakes up in the middle of the night in a pool of blood with a throbbing headache. She looks around to see that her room has been completely ransacked. Whitney screams for her parents, who rush in to find their daughter badly beaten, covered in blood, with a tire iron on the floor and the cord to her telephone cut. What could have possibly caused this to happen? Or who caused this to happen? Richard Ramirez. A serial killer in the 1980s who would break into houses, mutilate his victims, and leave satanic signs at their murder scenes. They called him the Night Stalker. And one summer night, Ramirez unlocks Whitney's bedroom window, crawls through, and repeatedly beats her over the head with a tire iron until she's unconscious. He then creeps into the kitchen looking for a knife to finish the job, but comes back empty-handed. He searches around the room and then begins to instead strangle Whitney with a telephone cord. But as he's choking Whitney, sparks begin flying from the telephone cord and the Night Stalker, who's a worshipper in Satan, takes this as a sign of divine intervention. In his head, he's thinking Jesus Christ is trying to save this girl and I need to leave. He drops the cord, flees the scene, and minutes later, Whitney wakes up. Luckily, she survives the savage attacks of the Night Stalker but not without a few scars. Whitney needs 478 stitches to close the lacerations to her scalp and undergoes minor cosmetic surgery. Just a little over a month later, Ramirez returns home to LA after taking a short trip to Arizona to visit his brother, completely unaware that he is the major story of every news outlet in Los Angeles. He then gets off a Greyhound bus, walks into a liquor store, and immediately a group of elderly Mexican women begin referring to him as El Matador, which translates to the killer. Ramirez then turns to see his face plastered on every front page of the newspaper rack, so he darts out of the store in a panic. He then begins sprinting across the Santa Ana freeway, trying to carjack as many people as he can, when a small mob of local residents begins to form. They chase him for nearly two miles until one of the residents strikes Ramirez over the head with a metal bar. They then relentlessly beat the Night Stalker until the cops show up and take him into custody. 
Three years later, Whitney actually ends up testifying against Ramirez in court, and even though some of the details of that tragic night remained foggy due to Whitney's head injuries, Ramirez was still found guilty of all charges, including 13 murders and 11 sexual assaults. He was on death row for 23 years due to California's strict capital punishment laws before dying of cancer at the age of 53. This preemptive death of the Night Stalker really makes me question how the victims felt. Were they glad that this monster was dead and removed from the world? Or did they prefer him to live out the rest of his life suffering in the conditions of prison? Or would they have rather have him get the death penalty and be killed whether a few weeks or a few months after his sentence? Tell me your thoughts in the comments below, I'd be really curious to see how you guys would feel if you were put in this situation. Anyway, let's get back to the story because this is one of the few instances where there's a happy ending. Frank Salerno was a key Los Angeles County detective for bringing justice to Ramirez's victims. And in 1993, his squad threw him a retirement party in celebration of 30 plus years of serving on the force. Hundreds attended, including friends, family, and people from past cases, including one, Whitney Bennett. It was at this retirement party that Whitney met Frank's son, Mike Salerno. The two exchanged numbers, went on a couple dates, and eventually got married. 